to start again with a new farm, new business plan vetting. And so if you're just joining us, uh, the, set, the session will work like this. We'll have 15 minutes with the beginning farmer presenting their business plan. And, uh, and then 15 minutes from our panel, expert panel. And then we'll have the remainder of the time uh, until 10.30 for your questions. Uh, so think about what you might want to ask the beginning farmer. Oh, great. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm happy to be here. My name is Sarah Hansen, and uh, I have a farm in north central Iowa, a Prairie Sky Farm. Um, <clears throat> as we're sitting here in Ames, I'm about 90 miles directly north. So if you take a straight shot north here of Ames, that's where my farm is located, just shy of the Minnesota border. Um, and uh, as you all are aware, I am a participant in the savings incentive program through the Practical Farmers of Iowa. Um, and so as a requirement of that program, um, PFI uh, would like us to submit a finalized business plan um, by the end of 2012. So um, what I'm going to be walking you through today is my initial draft of my proposed plan. Um, I've been saving $100 a month uh, for the last year or so and will continue to do so for the next year. So I uh, should, at the end of uh, two years, have a personal savings of $2,400, which will be matched by uh, Practical Farmers of Iowa through the Savings Incentive Program. So I'll have about $4,800 um, to invest in my farming operation. So the first draft of this plan is kind of um, explaining or introducing you to what I intend to use that $4,800 for. Um, and again, uh, I, I'll just mention too that over the course of 2012, I will be kind of adding more details to this plan and fleshing out some numbers. So. Anyway, so um, my proposal, uh, by the spring of 2013, I'd like to add a walk-in cooler and produce handling facility to my farming operation. Um, as you'll learn later, my first year of produce of official produce sales were in 2011, uh, just last year, so I'm uh, slowly building my operation. But I feel that um, this proposed investment would um, broaden my capacity to service and capture larger organic wholesale markets. Um, increase the production efficiency of my farm, and also overall help to ensure product quality through added refrigeration and storage capacity. I also have an off-farm job full-time, so my time is very limited. Um, so I feel like having, um, having access to refrigeration on my farm would be really helpful uh, for lab labor savings for my time, since I'm also um, off-farm a lot. When I am on the farm, I want to be sure that um, I have more flexibility in harvest time, so. And to give you a little bit of my background, for about a decade, um, I've been working on other farms. Um, worked on a farm in southwestern Minnesota, um, managed a prairie seed and restoration business uh, for a couple of years. Um, also farmed corn and soybeans, uh, was part of a ridge-till farming operation, so I do have some row crop experience. Uh, was combine queen for a fall. <laughs> That's what they called me anyway. <laughs> um, so I do have some, um, some background in that regard. I was born and raised on a farm in Iowa. My family still farms um, actually just three miles north of where I currently live. Um, so I moved back to my family's farm. Uh, but uh, after the farm in Minnesota, I moved to Wisconsin, worked on a CSA farm. Uh, we were... Um, selling about 500 CSA shares a year. I worked on that farm for two years. Um, so that was my first introduction to vegetable farming. And a light bulb went off in my head saying, oh my gosh, this, is, this could be the answer. I'm really interested in farming. Um, you know, have an interest in, interest in farming you know, corn and soybeans eventually down the road with my father. But um, the scale of vegetable operation that I was involved with was just, um, it was like a light bulb went on and I connected with that. So. Um, that was great experience. I learned uh, that farm was particularly mechanized and very efficient and profitable, so I gained a lot of experience there. And then I moved to Montana and managed a, managed a small farm for about four years um, and kind of furthered my experience. So. But by um, 2008, um, I had the opportunity to move home back to Iowa. Um, my great aunt had passed away, and my father was um, farming an 80-acre piece uh, that was originally my great-grandparents' um, homestead. So 
Um, I had to speak up if I was interested at that time, and I decided to do so, so I moved back home in 2008. Um, and as I mentioned, that is a century farm. Um, Burton was my grandpa, my dad's dad. There's his name and handprint in the cement outside my granary. So um, I moved back in 2008, and for the first couple of years, uh, the farm needed a lot of work. I worked off-farm, and a lot of my off-farm funds went into renovating the farm. Um, I got really good with a power nailer, <laughs> learned, <laughs> learned how to shingle, <laughs> worked on the house a lot, um, kind of you know, did a bunch of upgrading, upgraded electrical. Uh, my time was limited, so again, I wanted to, because I've, I have past experience working on farms and know how much labor is invested in the farming operation, I wanted to be sure that I got my um, farm place kind of up to speed and had funds to do so. So a lot of that was funded through um, personal savings and off-farm income. There's my dad and his coveralls helping there. Um, another picture. I have a lot of the old original outbuildings on my farm. This was my great grandma's chicken coop. I put new windows in. And there we are, hard at work, still. <laughs> um, uh, so just to summarize, in 2008 and 2009, my first two years back on my farm, um, uh, mostly I focused on fixing up the farm place. I also, I have uh, seven and a half tillable acres. Um, uh, what I purchased from my parents was 10 total. Um, so we kind of sliced off a rectangular shaped piece, which I purchased from my parents. So my father farms the rest of the 80 where I am. Um, so in 2008, I grew conventional soybeans. In 2009, I grew conventional corn. My dad helped me. Um, so we just farmed my seven and a half acres as part of his, the rest of his 80. Um, but by 2010, that was a big transition year for me. Um, I decided to start the transition process for my tillable acres, so I uh, enrolled in the Environmental Quality Incentives Program uh, for Organic um, Agriculture and developed a, a plan for my farm. So currently, it's um, I have alfalfa. I have uh, seeded oats and alfalfa in 2010. Um, so I have five acres of alfalfa, and then I also seeded two acres of um, prairie buffer strips to. Um, uh, kind of border my, or buffer my uh, main field from the rest of my neighbors, which one is my father, so <laughs> hopefully he's a good neighbor, but um, <laughs> uh, lets me know uh, what's going on. Um, and then I also decided to um, take part in the Natural Resources Conservation Service uh, Seasonal High Tunnel um, cost sharing program. So in 2010, with the help of friends and family again, um, we constructed a high tunnel on my farm. Um, and part of the reason I decided to do that as well, in my past experience, I'd been really good at record keeping on other farms where I was working, and I saw the potential for profitability growing in a high tunnel. Um, so I knew that as part of my uh, beginning farming operation, I wanted to incorporate a high tunnel. So um, here's a picture of my back field. My oats are coming up. I was very proud. Um, here's my father helping me out mowing the first year. We, we just mowed my oats and alfalfa for free weed control the first year. And then this was last year, the second year. This is kind of the back view of my farm. You can see my um, five acres of alfalfa. And then you can also see my um, prairie buffer strips. Um, it's a little bit easier to see here. Um, you can kind of see the southern, southern fence line. And then it, it just kind of borders my, borders my acres there. Um, and you can see the, the high tunnel that was constructed as well. So by 2012, um, the reason I decided to move toward organic certification, um, I was also involved with, we started a local a natural foods co-op in Algona, and I was very involved with that for the first two years. Um, so I was seeing potential not only in our local area in northern Iowa for organic produce. I think most people are interested in buying locally, but I did also see a potential market for organic. And I also, um, knowing that I have adjacent land to work with as well through my family, um, I just thought it would be wise to go ahead and start the certification process to potentially access larger area and regional um, certified organic wholesale markets. So I will be going through the certification process this year. I'll do paperwork in March, and then they'll come out and inspect my farm in August. So past experience, I talked a little bit about earlier. This was the farm in Wisconsin where I worked at Vermont Valley Community Farm. So we had a high tunnel, and we did early season spring shares, and also grew tomatoes. Um, 
It was a great experience. Another reason that I wanted to um, build on that past experience moving forward with my own operation. This is the farm in Montana where I worked. We had a high tunnel as well and about four acres of vegetable production. So I was um, manager of the farm and uh, oversaw our high tunnel production there as well. So here's um, friends and family. Uh, we've got the plastic put on my high tunnel in September of 2010. Cause for celebration. <laughs> the wind didn't blow too much. <laughs> and so 2011, to kind of get us closer back to present day, um, 2011 uh, was my first day of, of uh, first spring of official planting for sales from my farm. So um, there I am in it's early April. Um, and three key market opportunities that I observe, observe throughout the season. Um, all of the early season produce that I took to market and sold at our local food co-op was just gone in, in seconds. Um, when I would take produce to farmer's market, within the first hour I'd sell out. Um, and I was able to pack up and head home. So um, also I noticed that a consistent supply of, um, you know, these are some very specific things that I noticed. A specific supply of, um, you know, lettuce heads is needed at our local food co-op. And area grocery stores also expressed interest in purchasing um, tomatoes. So my marketing goals for 2012, um, continue to do some farmer's market early in the season and direct sales um, from my high tunnel. And then also focus on wholesaling to local restaurants, grocery stores, and our natural food co-op. Um, some of my uh, strengths and opportunities, um, as I mentioned, some of my previous farming experience. I also participated in a high tunnel crop production um, uh, budget analysis for 2011 through Iowa State University Extension. So I do have records from my 2011 season. So I can see um, how I did with my crops last year. And that's another reason I'm kind of choosing to focus on tomatoes and, and lettuce and some other greens this year because I've looked at the numbers from my production. Um, and would like to move forward and focus on some of those. Some of the other things I've mentioned earlier, too. Some of my um, weaknesses and threats, of course, de balancing demands of the farm with an off-farm job. <clears throat> I'm not used to talking so much. <laughs> I'm usually the quiet one <clears throat> back in the corner. Um, but balancing the demands of my uh, managing my farm with an off-farm job. My off-farm job is also in agriculture, so I have peak um, seasonal workloads in my off-farm job as well. So I, I don't lack for things to do. Um, some other strengths and opportunities. Um, going through certification will kind of position me in my current market. Um, there's also, as I mentioned, increasing demand for a product in our area. We have some really fun um, collaborative uh, potentials going on in my area too, uh, possibilities to partner with other producers and also partner with other businesses who are currently delivering to like the Twin Cities or Des Moines, Ames area. Um, of course, external weaknesses, weather, variable, market demand, and uh, again, relying, you know, if I'm going to focus on wholesaling to grocery stores, um, <clears throat> you know, depending upon the wholesaler to continue to maintain high standards of product quality and presentation. And then, of course, competition for local markets. And here's my mission statement that I came up with while I was working on this plan. Um, to provide fresh cert certified organic vegetables to local and potential regional markets through direct and wholesale marketing efforts, while simultaneously making a viable return on my produce and managing a workload that enables, enables me to be consistent with both quality and supply. Um, so here, again, are my intermediate goals. I feel like adding a wash station and walk-in cooler to my operation would really help me position to increase my capacity um, to access more markets. Right now, I'm just utilizing an extra refrigerator. <laughs> um, so I, I also um, take that into consideration with my, um, with my marketing plan for the, for the upcoming year. You know, how much capacity do I currently have? And I, it's really important for me to be consistent and maintain quality. So. But here's, uh, here's one of my outdoor gardens and um, my, my high tunnel there in the background. But I, I do have a granary and a cattle shed that I'm looking at uh, converting. So kind of still going through the process of determining whether or not it would be economically feasible to utilize a an existing structure on my farm um, to uh, 
build a facility. Um, some of my longer term goals, of course, have my vegetable operation um, meet my net cash income needs. It's important for me to make a profit, especially if I'm still maintaining an off-farm job. Um, I want what I'm doing at home on my farm to be profitable. I want my time to be well spent. Um, I also would like to uh, become more mechanized. Um, I do have access to machinery from my uh, family, which is helpful, but also integrate some more um, you know, wash station uh, processing options. Um, and then also down the road, my father still farms 320 acres. Um, and uh, I would really like to, over time, partner with him. Um, we have, um, and I can talk about this more a little bit later, but um, I do have the opportunity to purchase the rest of the 80 where I currently live. Um, and so as part of the process of my business planning, um, that's also a, a factor in my, um, a factor in my future. Um, and also being sure, you know, maintaining some off-farm income at this time so that I'm sure that um, when that point comes that I can uh, afford to uh, purchase additional land. So with that, um, there's my alfalfa and border, and there's my <laughs> father's field. <laughs> um, but I, I did throw together a quick balance sheet, um, uh, just a few num quick numbers. I do have um, a mortgage on my farm. I do have some um, uh, um, equity in that farm. Um, I also have a small truck loan, so my, my uh, liabilities are, I'm trying to keep those pretty small at this point. And if I do make any um, additional investment in my farm, in it, you know, uh, I'd like it to be um, just focusing on, on additional land purchases. So, um, and then projections for 2012. Um, this is what I kind of penciled out for, for, the, for the year, focusing on some of my main crops that I intend to, sale, to sell. Um, then I have some other off-farm income. I do get a CRP payment annually for my two acres. And then I do a little bit of um, ecological consulting on the side. And then um, last year I rented out my alfalfa acres because we, my family had moved on from haying from years before. And so I did rent out my alfalfa acres to a neighbor who hayed it. Um, and then farm operating expenses for me there, I do, in, I do have a, a pretty detailed uh, budget and cash flow um, spreadsheet at home that I, that I utilize. Um, but that, that includes you know, things like seedling mix and soybean meal and all my cost of expenses. Um, and I, I did look at my Schedule Fs. I do have Schedule Fs from 2008 when I was um, working with my father and growing um, conventional corn and soybeans as well. So, I'm able to look back from 2008 and on ahead. Um, so, but what I uh, project to net um, next year is about 4,500. So, as we were talking earlier about labor too, that does allow for me to account. I, I don't account for my labor in here, but it hopefully will account for some of my time. And then for those of you who are looking into um, kind of projecting expenses and talking more about labor, um, I really, I utilized um, Ag Decision Maker from Iowa State University. If you haven't gone to that website, I think it's really important um, to do so. So like for <clears throat> a couple of my main crops, tomatoes and lettuce, lettuce heads, I was able to um, use those spreadsheets and plug in a lot of my costs and labor expenses to, to project um, what return I would have um, for those particular ones. Um, the website, or you can search for Ag Decision Maker. Mm -hmm. They've got all kinds of um, spreadsheets formatted. Craig Chase, um, I don't know if Craig's in the room, but um, um, Craig Chase has developed a lot of these enterprise budgets. Uh, Sarah, I just have to state, when you started off presenting, you made a very important comment about business planning. And um, you talked about how it's evolving. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely one of those work in progress. I think sometimes we get stuck in the rut where we, we make our plan. It's a great preparation. But we have to keep in mind it's not predictable. And it's not the crystal ball that we're going to look into and forecast the future for us, because we also know 
that times change. <laughs> and so anyway, um, the one thing with business planning is that it's a true tool for success if you keep reviewing it and keep it flexible. So have it be that living, breathing document that you referenced, referenced it to be. Again, your work experience is truly admirable in how you are presenting and working through your passion with your farm job. Um, one of the things that I liked was your marketing strategy. And I don't think you referenced it when you were talking about the $2 bag. Oh, yeah. Would you like to share that just sure. for a minute? Sure. Um, part of my marketing strategy, um, at the beginning of the season, I set my price list. Um, and working with the retailers and um, restaurants, I usually uh, will send them my price list and availability list for the season. Um, but when I go to Farmer's Market, for example, and some of my sales to our local co-op, um, I, I utilize the $2 bag. So um, I set my price list, and then I bag $2 quantities of produce. Um, so it's really easy at Farmer's Market. It's a little extra work up front doing the bagging, but, you know, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, um, you know, it's a really, really um, nice strategy. Um, I think the quantities are adequate. Um, people have never complained about quantity. Um, so that has worked really well for me. Very good. And um, also, the niche. Continue to focus on your niche. When I was reading through your plan and I was listening to this today, I just kept thinking affordable, healthy food alternatives. That's, mm -hmm. that's what you've got going on. And mm -hmm. that's just a great thing where we need to be in society and, and the, the pain points we experience um, as a society as it relates to obesity and the gluten-free diets. We just need to keep that out front with everyone. Um, and I think you truly do that. You talked about pain point of uh, time management. Mm -hmm. Just some recommendations is uh, definitely look for volunteering. You have a lot of experience. You have a passion in this. So there's great opportunities for gathering youth, mm -hmm. such as through high schools, churches, 4-H, uh, possibly FFA. All those individuals need some form of community service hours in order to get a beautiful court at graduation. Mm -hmm. And so I really encourage you to you know, share your knowledge and start paying it forward with those individuals because it'd be great to have more of those um, individuals in involved with affordable, healthy food alternatives. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great job. All right, Sarah. I'd also like to echo what Renee said and very nicely jo done job on the plan. Uh, one thing that this group did not see is on the very first page of your plan, you had listed a pretty extensive list of an advisory team. Yes. <laughs> and that includes some family members, mm -hmm. includes some uh, friends who are also farmers. It included an uh, FSA uh, loan officer. It included your accountant. Mm -hmm. You were really mm -hmm. working with a diverse group, and that I would encourage everybody mm -hmm. who's building a, a business plan or developing a farm operation to identify the team, mm -hmm. use that team. They're going to give you some really good ideas. Mm -hmm. I thought that was real good. Um, I'm going to also echo those $2 bags. <laughs> the, uh, the ability to go to a place and know what it's going to cost is terrific. Mm -hmm. One of the worst experiences I had is I went to a peach orchard years ago, and I was figuring on spending about $20 for peaches. These peaches were just absolutely immense. And I took a look at the price, took a look at the peaches, but didn't really think about what I was going to be spending. Well, within about three minutes, we gathered these monster peaches, which are about a pound, pound and a half each. Went to the cash register, it was almost 50 bucks. And we had to scramble to come up with enough cash to be able to pay for it. So if they had a bag that said $20 or $10, mm -hmm. it gives that comfort for the, the customers to do it. I think that's a terrific idea. Mm -hmm. Uh, you also had a great, in your plan, you also had a great uh, breakdown of your high tunnel. You've done the analysis, you know, high tunnel to four and a half by 25 foot long. This is your income. These are your expenses. A real nice breakdown on that. So I really like that also. And again, echoing what Renee had said, a uh, good diverse experience. I saw some of the mountains in the background and yeah. one of the locations I was ready to go hiking up there. So yeah. <laughs> the variety was terrific. Mm -hmm. um, on the flip side, you know, you put together the plan, you put together some of the, the time that you're going to spend harvesting or producing, time you're going to spend harvesting, but there was no real mention at all about the time you were spending on marketing. Mm -hmm. Now, you kind of alluded to it, saying that on my way to work, to or from, I'm going to drop products off. Right. But, uh, you know, mm -hmm. that is a lot of time to think about it, to do some of the marketing. Mm -hmm. Really didn't allocate that too much. I'd also stated early in the early presentation that uh, sometimes you need to step back and take a look at the big picture of, of what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Again, you've got a fairly small operation right now. You had indicated in your pl business plan your uh, ownership cost, but you'd put in about $2.60 per 
um, high tunnel. Well, if you translate that mm -hmm. to your operation projection, your ownership cost for everything was about $95. Mm -hmm. Now, for a business, again, that's where the economies of scale come in. Mm -hmm. The small operation, mm -hmm. the cost of ownership is going to be bigger. Mm -hmm. As you know, as a percentage, as you get bigger, mm -hmm. those ownership costs are going to be uh, going to get smaller. Mm -hmm. So again, it's stepping back, taking a look at the big picture. Am I really allocating for the size that I'm at currently? Mm -hmm. um, you were also a little bit optimistic, I would say, in the hours that you were spending. You know, we've talked mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. you know, what's your time worth? Will you put together the analysis for the uh, production and the harvesting, and you put the hours for that? Based on that, you would figure it about, calculate it to be about 200 hours per year, which again is, is a chunk, but it's tunnel. not, yeah. right, and I have the feeling it's quite a bit for more the high than tunnel. that. But actually in 2011, um, keeping track of my labor hours in there, I was ab at about 200. Okay, okay. So. That's <laughs> I could have spent more. My time was pretty limited, so I had to. Some days I was flying, literally <laughs> flying through there. <laughs> but um, yeah, I could, uh, and I think with a little bit more careful man or a little bit more um, production and time management, I can even maximize my production in there. But um, about, t I think just under 200 is where I was um, okay. with what I tracked last year. So you're tied in pretty good. That's great. You really re had a really solid plan, fairly conservative, but um, mm -hmm. you knew your costs real well. Mm -hmm. um, Real nice job. Thank you. David. I'm following two bankers here, so um, <laughs> they've already got all the details out there. Um, so w once again, long term, think big. I like, um, I like the plan. I, I love the tomatoes. <laughs> I don't think you can go wrong with tomatoes. Um, yeah, you know, think about another tu high tunnel, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at, at some point here. Um, I have a question on renting the hay. Mm -hmm. um, what is the thinking there with regard to running the five acres or so? Of, of right. I, throughout the, since I was transitioning um, and I wasn't utilizing my field area, I, I will carve out garden areas um, in, that, in that field here in the next year um, and beyond. Uh, but since I wasn't um, a producing vegetable crops on that acreage last year, um, I decided to try to generate a little income. And since my family doesn't have haying equipment anymore, I had a neighbor who was interested in haying it, so he rented. I called Iowa State and um, kind of tried to get a gauge on what hayland rental figures were, and okay. we talked about it, and he decided to rent it from me. So okay. just to well, utilize, the, utilize the ground right. and generate well, you, you a little bit of You have seven and a half acres, which is, uh, you could design a, a, an unbelievable plan you know, mm -hmm. a very long-term plan. You know, maybe there's other things I'm sure you're thinking about. Right, um, yep. Because the, the opportunity cost there is so, uh, I think you're getting $100 an acre for, for the hay. You know, what can you do longer term with that land? Mm -hmm. and, yep. and also to bring people to the farm potentially. Right. You know, and you've just right. got, you mm -hmm. know, it's just so wide open mm -hmm. with what you could do mm -hmm. with that spot. Yep, yep. Um, so, um, a question on the financing. Mm -hmm. I believe you have a 15-year mortgage. I do. And then you have a, a truck loan, mm -hmm. uh, which is shorter term and higher interest mm -hmm. rate. You know, I would just say maybe you go with a 30-year mortgage instead and not have the truck loan. So mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is right. a minor, minor issue, but yeah. if you're, you know, if, if capital is short, mm -hmm. don't pay it back that fast mm -hmm. as, long as, it, as, mm -hmm. as long as the interest rate mm -hmm. isn't too much different. So you can always <laughs> prepay, you can always yeah. prepay, and you can I know, refinance. My dad told me the same thing when I decided on 15 years um, uh -huh. for that mortgage, but in my mind, I just, I, I want to uh, pay down as much of that debt as I can, as quickly right. as I What's can. What's the interest rate on that? Uh, four and a half. Okay. And mm -hmm. the interest rate on the truck loan is six or so. Right. So but that will be, yep, and that, that will be paid off in August, so. Um, well, I would and if I have a little extra, I'm going to push it on to that right away. If you so. buy the 80, Mm -hmm. You probably don't want to go with the 15 year. Right. So. Yeah. <laughs> no, nope. don't do 15 on the 80. So yeah, don't short yourself on mm -hmm. that. that yep. you, know, uh, yep. you can prepay it without penalty. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. sure the bankers here would be happy you mm -hmm. know, if, you did, that's if true. you did that. So. That's good. In that, yeah. Um, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's good advice. Thank you. <laughs> no, great plan. Good luck. Thank you. So we're going to have questions from the audience. Let's start with you, Jake. Can I have a question from David again? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to kind of reference this. You uh, discussed the 65 or 7% interest on the truck loan. 
compared to the four and a half on the 15 year note. But uh, what's the volume of interest being paid there? If the, if the truck loan's gonna be paid off in August, does the 7% really amount to anything? It could be 15% if you're gonna pay it off in August. You're really only gonna pay 50 or 80 bucks in interest. It doesn't amount to much. I think it's just an issue of if you have you know, looking out over five years, if you have capital expenditures you're going to have to put into the farm, uh, you know, just don't shirt yourself on putting the capital back, on paying it back on a, a mortgage quicker than you have to. It's flexibility more than anything else. So you have the flexibility to run your business, mm -hmm. and every year is not as, you know, perhaps the same as the year before, so you, you need the flexibility. It's like an insurance program, if you will, buying insurance. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Cash is king. Yeah. You said that you uh, carved out 10 acres out of your dad's 80. So he, he owned land three miles away, and he lived three miles away. And there was a house on this place where the 80 acres is, and you carved out the 10 acres around the house. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. yep. Yep, so my, my parents farm about three miles north of me. Um, there's another 240 acres up there around their home place. Um, and then there's this 80 that my great-grandparents um, originally homes or farmed. You talked a little bit at the beginning about uh, possibly looking into wholesale sales. Mm -hmm. um, given your limited time available, and the wholesale typically being larger volumes, are there certain products that you're going to focus on in that? Or what, I guess, mm -hmm. definition of wholesale are you going sure. for with that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and for me, with my kind of considering my current time availability, uh, one reason I also chose to f kind of focus on tomatoes this year, there was a, uh, I saw an apparent demand um, for them locally um, and the potential for um, increased um, volume, uh, increased production to meet area markets for that. But also, um, uh, I have a window of time kind of in August and September um, when there's a lot of tomato harvesting going on um, in the high tunnel. So that was another consideration of mine. When am I going to have, you know, sort of these um, peak times on the farm where I'm not, my demands for my off-farm job are not as great. Um, another... Um, uh, thing I'm considering is, you know, longer term storage crops like root crops. I really um, enjoy growing carrots as well and that's something else I'd like to uh, look into and with more storage capability um, could try to pursue some of those markets. But I have more time again in November and December and so if I'm able to do large harvests of those root crops and be able to sell, nobody else in my local area is really um, selling uh, much beyond you know, September and October. So I'd like to try to capitalize on some of the um, market potential in November, December, January, um, when I have more, more time as well. So, and I, I can assemble a, a crew for mass harvesting, and um, I do have access to, um, I have visited with a few individuals who'd be willing to come out to my farm like on um, Sunday afternoons and help me um, with weeding and harvesting and whatnot. So I do have um, kind of a labor force backup if I need uh, beyond my friends and family who have already helped me a, a great deal. So that is something too that I will look into and I've considered um, also um, hiring an intern or having somebody um, work on my farm as well. On your projected income statement, mm -hmm. are those wholesale prices? Um, yeah, those those are mm -hmm, for okay. me. Like those come from my price list that I set at the beginning of the year, and I don't I don't shift those prices at all. And that's one of my strategies with some of my customers. Um, you know, especially with restaurants. You know, I think what restaurants are seeing, they see variability in pricing over the season, and I can go to them and say, "Yep, I'm you know my tomatoes are." this much per pound and that's not going to change over the year or try to you know I'm, I'm definitely willing to work with my customers on pricing but um, yeah is that the same price you're using for farmers market yeah mm -hmm. at least at this point in my operation so can you explain the uh, two dollar bag again sure sure um, 
What, uh, what I do is just establish my price list at the beginning of the season, and then, um, like, if my carrots are two dollars, if I'm selling my carrots for two dollars a pound, I put a do or put a pound in a bag um, to take to market. So that's a two dollar, you know, two dollar value, two dollar quantity of my product. Um, or if I sell my bunching onions for two dollars a bunch, you know, two dollars worth of bunching onions goes in the bag, or two dollars worth of beets. I just I kind of do the math, and I have a little cheat sheet. Um, spreadsheet posted above my scale, and so um, I know what quantities are, you know, what the $2 values are, so. No, it's just one item. Yep, one item. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the back here. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, mm -hmm. Could you explain, particularly for your outside uh, beds, could you explain uh, what you're going to do with uh, weeds in your org organic uh, um, operation? Sure. Um, most of what I do right now is I, I um, don't have any, you know, mechanized, um, I don't have a tractor or any cultivating equipment. So most of my um, labor regarding weed control is by hand. I have a, um, I have a wheel hoe and some other tools that I utilize, um, but most of that's done by hand. Um, I have done some uh, um, cover cropping. So if there are any areas in my, in current production, um, I do kind of flip-flop and do some cover cropping as well um, if I'm not utilizing the space for the entire season. Um, and, uh, yeah, otherwise just, um, I think we were talking yesterday, maybe Rufus was mentioning the best, um, you know, pest and weed control um, is to also have really good soil. So I, I um, try to pay attention to what I'm putting into my soil. And I use a lot of mulch as well for weed control. So I... Um, in one of my main outside garden areas, it's it's still small enough that I can um, mulch all my walkways and keep traffic pretty limited. So I utilize mulch quite a bit too to to help with weeding. Uh, what what do you suggest for a cover crop in a vegetable garden? Um, I've used um, anything from buckwheat. I've kind of experimented with a variety of different things. I've grown buckwheat. I've grown oats and um, uh, winter rye some different things like that. So I'm just kind of in the experimenting, uh, experimental phase with that. Um, Could you repeat the question? Pardon? Could you repeat the question? Is there a favorite for, for cover crop? Um, I don't know. For me, oats is, oats is really easy. They're really accessible. I can run down to my local co-op and pick up a bag. And like at the end of the season in one of my gardens, I, I have a little broadcast seeder. I'll just broadcast seed oats, and there will be enough time for them to come up and provide some cover through the winter. So I try not to leave anything, any of my garden space bare um, over the winter. And then um, if there's enough growth, then I can, I can even burn it off in the, <laughs> the spring. Um, so it's Pretty easy to do, pretty easy to control. It sounds like your family's been like a pretty traditional farming in the past. How did mm -hmm. you go about convincing them to do something unconventional like mm -hmm. you're doing? Um, that's a, yeah, that's a good question. Um, interestingly, um, interestingly enough, my, my family is very supportive of, of my vegetable farming efforts. Um, so I do have I do have good support there, and and although my dad does farm conventional corn and soybeans, um, he is interested in what I'm doing and very supportive. Um, and he is 63, um, so at this point in his life, although he's interested in what I'm doing, he doesn't necessarily want to you know start switching his operation <laughs> around. So that's where um, for me, um, he's. Uh, like, for example, he rented 160 acres from my grandmother who just passed away this past September. So he's had to buy land again. You know, basically he's already paid for the farm once through rent over the years. Um, he's having to purchase another 80 himself. So that's where he and I are trying to stay close in conversation. And for me to, um, he's trying to help me in, um, if I do choose to purchase land, that I do it earlier on in my life, um, uh, he's seeing the value in that, that you know, I could have that land paid for by the time I retire instead of him having to take on another mortgage at the age when he should be retiring. So um, that's very, I'm very grateful that we have a good relationship in that way. Um, so although he's not, he's not gonna be out helping me weed my broccoli, but, uh, but he's, he still supports me. Oh, one, one of the things in your plan that you talked about 
was considering selling to some restaurants. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I haven't heard a whole heck of a lot in the program mm -hmm. so far is mm -hmm. the connection between the farmer and the, and the restaurants. Mm -hmm. In uh, the east where I'm from, there's an awful lot of uh, connection between the farms and mm -hmm. the restaurants. Mm -hmm. The one beef farm started, been at it for about four or five years. They're currently working with 50 different restaurants right now. Wow. So it's mm -hmm. been a huge uh, mm -hmm. plan. You alluded to it in your plan, but mm -hmm. didn't say much about it and want to get your thoughts right. on that. Sure. Um, I think I'm fortunate. The, the restaurant I have been working with in my local community in Algona is the Daily Bread and Bakery. Um, and I know the owner of the business, Allison, and she's very solid. Um, I think one of the issues with selling to restaurants, and I have sold to restaurants in the past, is you know high turnover rate of chefs. And so I remember working in Montana. I, had a chef who said, yep, all the garlic you guys can grow, we'll buy it. You know, they wanted to put roasted garlic on their menu. So I increased our production for the next season and then he left, you know, and, and they weren't interested in buying the garlic anymore. Um, so I think that there is, you know, some issue with selling to restaurants that, um, um, for me, fortunately, the ones I am currently working with, um, I know that they're, I know that um, the owner of the business is not, is not going over where, going anywhere. There's not going to be a huge turnover. And um, like Allison, she, is, uh, her bakery is certified organic as well. So we've got some good things going on in our, in our area. And she's also one who is delivering to like Whole Foods in the Twin Cities and some other, um, some other larger markets. So there is potential for um, us to partner together over the years um, and maybe try to combine, um, you know, do some combined deliveries over time to some of these larger markets. How many people in the room have a business plan? Just raise your hand if you have a business plan in progress, draft, or complete. Great. <laughs> Questions? I'm just wondering if you figured out how much the walk-in cooler and the produce wash station are probably going to cost you. Yeah, that's um, that's what I'll be really kind of delving into and in over the next year. Um, I've looked at, and I'm still kind of debating whether to utilize my some of my existing infrastructure, you know, that granary or the cattle shed. Um, so I'll be running numbers this season to try and figure out, you know, um, try to project out um, my operation over the years. And, you know, I want to build to capacity, too, to be sure that if I'm... Um, installing something and building a wa you know um, incorporating a wash facility that I that I build bigger than um, you know what my definitely what my current capacity is so that I don't have to redo it you know in five years but um, so I'm kind of evaluating utilizing my existing buildings or whether building another separate structure would be um, beneficial I've looked at the cool bot you know utilize you know using the cool bot and um, kind of building my own within like one of the compartments of my granary, for example. So just doing some different um, research in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say you should be commended, I think. I guess I feel because you have, um, you've, your view on things, I guess, is, is a, is, seems to be a, a moderate view. I like the fact that you can understand what your father does with conventional corn and soybeans yet you still have a plan to do what you want to do through organic stuff, but you don't think he's wrong and he doesn't think you're wrong. And in the world today, especially in Iowa, you're either wrong if you do organic or you're wrong if you do conventional. And I think there needs to be middle ground mm -hmm. if you're going to get anybody to move anywhere. So I think you should be commended for that. Thank you. Yeah, somebody, actually, to speak to that a little bit, some, another farmer yesterday was telling me that we need more women conventional farmers. Um, as well, and um, you know, I'm not opposed to uh, partnering with my father currently. Um, you know, working with him in his operation. Um, you know, I although I, I wouldn't choose to. You know, I'd love to have all of all of our acres be organic, but um, you know, and maybe that'll happen at some point. But for now, I'm I'm also um, happy to just be supporting him in his operation as well. Any other questions? So why aren't you doing this full time? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, good question. Um, I, yeah, when I, 
you know, to speak to that, um, when I moved home in 2008, I didn't have a job. I had some personal savings and just really good intentions of, um, you know, I just, I've always been the type of person to kind of, you know, figure, you know, figure things out, do what it needs to take to get by, keep my bills paid. Um, so when I moved home, I did some, you know, temp work in 2008. Um, ended up being involved with our local food co-op project, so I was actually the store manager for the first two years. Um, so I learned a lot about retail and um, really enjoyed that job, but really I'm a farmer at heart and um, I was just, um, although I enjoyed retail, I really knew that I belonged back out on my farm and trying to push that forward. So I actually left the co-op after two years with the intention of farming full-time again, um, piecing together some off-farm work. And then, um, you know, with uh, just kind of feeling, I was doing some temporary work for um, Pioneer Research over the winter um, to kind of help keep the bills paid and keep some cash coming in. Um, and then my grandmother, my grandmother's health started to fail. And so um, then in, within my family, we started talking about land and um, what to do with our family's land. And my brothers got involved. I have two brothers. And at one point, we thought, you know, my brothers and I were going to buy that 80. And so I was getting really concerned about um, having capital um, to support my family's farming operation. Um, so when I was offered, when I was offered a full-time job again, um, um, I decided to, in mid-June, take that full-time job again, <laughs> just after kind of letting myself go and thinking I was finally going to farm full-time. But that's kind of the reasoning behind um, my decision to go back to working off-farm, um, was just to try to build some more um, security, financial security, um, uh, so that I can um, help support my family's operation as well, with land prices and, you know, variability there. Um, that, that was my decision. So I'm still kind of trying to grow my vegetable operation on the side as much as I can. I don't, I certainly don't want to let go of that, but I'm trying to do it carefully and thoughtfully um, so that it can all kind of work together over the years. So yeah, I, ultimately I would love to be a full-time farmer and I will be one of these days, but for the time being, um, I just still feel like I need a little bit of that security from off-farm income. I guess I got a question for you and, and for Janice, and that's the, where you're working full time, and you got the you got the commitments for the farm. Also, is you know how do you try to balance your work? Because again, it's going to be the conflict. You're at work. You want to be home. Mm -hmm. You're at home. Mm -hmm. You need to be at work. Uh, mm -hmm. Doing some of the work maybe at home versus at the office. Have you tried to work with your employer to establish the hours, try to modify them mm -hmm. so that you've got maximum time during farming hours to mm -hmm. to make that work? Same thing for you is, mm -hmm. is try um, to get that right balance. Sure, um, for my current job, that just um, that just wouldn't be wouldn't be an option for me to kind of have that flex time. My hours, um, especially during peak, you know, spring and fall times, it's you know, uh, some days I, I'm at my day job until 10, 11 o'clock at night. So um, it's just like you know, farming. My since my job is in agriculture. Um, I do have pretty high demands there for my time. So unfortunately, right now, um, that's not very flexible for my schedule. So I'm trying to adapt my plan um, to fit that as well. So. Uh, for me, uh, engineering is an extremely hour-intensive career. Um, but honestly, I just don't put as much into my career as I maybe could. <laughs> um, uh, and honestly, Ryan is the one whose schedule suffers. Um, I don't do a lot of the production stuff. I'm not out there until 10 p.m. He is. Um, and he, this recent part-time job he picked up at the NRCS does affect that, uh, and that has put a huge amount of stress on our family. Um, but he is temporary, he is part-time, and he dictates his hours. <laughs> so um, that's pretty much how he deals with that. <laughs> what do other businesses do that you see uh, with this conflict? You know, I mean, I'm sure this is a common problem, right, when you start a business? It is a very common uh, conflict, and it's often a source of uh, difficulty between the spouses that I've seen, where there's just not enough hours mm -hmm. or enough time for the family members, mm -hmm. where vacations, mm -hmm. where time together suffers. Mm -hmm. uh, they try to structure their work hours as much as possible, their, their farm hours, their personal life hours. And if they're kind of organized and kind of set Friday's date night, mm -hmm. uh, 
makes a huge difference mm -hmm. because if farming flows over one day into the next, especially with weather where you can't always keep to your schedule, if you don't set, a time, set aside time for the family, mm -hmm. that's really where you get hurt. That's mm -hmm. usually last in the line. <laughs> Luke's asking me to repeat it to the microphone. I said my husband's outside with my daughter, and does he want to repeat that later when, when he's around? There you are. Hey, this man here says we need to set date night and stick to it. <laughs> <laughs> February, it's a good time. <laughs> Dates. Sarah, I was just wondering how that actually looks in a week for you. Like, what are essential times when you need to be on the farm for irrigation or for harvest mm -hmm. or for farmer's market? Sure. Um, well, the, the position I'm uh, working right now full-time started mid-June of this past year, so I'm still kind of going through the full, full season cycle for that, um, those job responsibilities and duties. Um, but yeah, my days are long right now, especially during the growing season. Um, yeah, I, I'm up early to take care of business on the farm. I'm gone most of the day, and then when I get home, I'm, you know, I'm usually not in the house until... Uh, after dark. <laughs> so that's just kind of, um, it's, it's been my choice to, to do that, to try to balance both. Um, and uh, I don't have a family, um, so that for me, you know, I'm, I'm uh, I, I do have a family, but I don't have my own family. I don't have, I don't have kids at this point or anything like that. So um, I am kind of able to, um, you know, focus on, on the farm um, and not let go of some of those other responsibilities so um, I'm work with with the lender that could have some impact on some things here in Iowa and I'm very interested in the um, relationship of off-farm income I've, I've noticed that um, in both of these plans and in most of that I have seen um, we, we I'd like to know how the lenders see the role of our far farm income and what you would like to see incorporated into a business plan from um, off farm income. All right, that is truly a tricky one. There is the political uh, answer that uh, lenders give, and then there's a realistic answer that lenders give. Uh, the political answer is that uh, lenders think the off-farm income is very important uh, with the idea that somewhere along the way if the farm becomes profitable enough, that can go away. The realistic answer that a lot of lenders have is that they take some great comfort in that uh, non-farm income because that'll pay the mortgage payments, that'll pay the living expenses, and they've got the comfort that as long as that continues, even if the farm is not necessarily profitable, at the time projection that they have that that income is there. So without it, if the plan is based entirely on the growth of the business, lenders get a little bit nervous. If that uh, non-farm income is there, that's kind of the hedge that they know that uh, the mortgage is going to be paid, the living expenses are going to be covered, and that realistically, until the farm becomes profitable, usually that non-farm income does, uh, stays in place. It depends a lot on the type of business. I've worked with horse operations, and again, being a little unfair, very few horse operations make money. If there's, a, if there's no uh, non-farm uh, income, a lender's going to shy away from it. If that non-farm income is there, they're going to be more likely. So there's different types of businesses uh, where we look uh, at the non-farm income a little bit harder. I seem to get a lot of attention from the audience. Let's get some feedback maybe on that. Is that different question? Anybody want to? Have some feedback on that question, beginners? I saw a lot of people visiting with their neighbor. <laughs> you talked about your dad having to buy the family farm at age 63 mm -hmm. after he had rented it for most of his farming mm -hmm. career. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering if you could speak at all to any plans that you have for succession mm -hmm. when you and your brothers maybe purchase this ground mm -hmm. so that you don't 
end up in the same position. Right. Well, what happened um, with my family, my grandma passed away in September, um, and we'd kind of been, at my, as a family, we'd been anticipating that for some months. Um, and so my brothers and I at one point thought that, um, well, t if I can step back a minute, since my, my folks, their farm is about, he, mom and dad farm about 240 acres north of me. So there'd be 160 acres um, that, he, that my father had been renting from my grandmother. Um, he had purchased another 80 some years ago across the road. Um, so 160 acres, I have two aunts um, who would be inheriting a section of that 160. So at one point, my brothers and I um, thought that we would form you know, an LLC. We were looking at different options to buy out my aunts. Um, but my, uh, what ended up happening was my father just decided to um, uh, purchase that 80 himself. Um, uh, he kind of worked that out through his, his financing. And then what he and I decided was that um, the most beneficial thing for me would be to, instead of me buying the 80 up where my parents live, it'd be better for me to add on to my acres where I currently live, just add on to, you know, have adjacent farmland that makes more sense for my operation. So um, he's just, he I think he just signed the paperwork for... Um, this recent deal, so he's just kind of getting through that. We're kind of waiting, um, waiting a little bit, and then he and I will again start, you know, conversing about, you know, what, you know, Dad, when is, what would the optimum time be for me to start, you know, chunking off some of that 80, whether it's another 10 acres or 20, or making my piece a complete 40, if I want to do the whole 80. Um, so we're, um, he's kind of wanted to kind of get through this process that he's been going through, and then he and I will start talking about um, how to build acres where I live. But we decided instead of me um, purchasing, you know, land north where my parents currently farm, that um, he would go ahead with that, and then I would just um, continue to buy on buy land from him. So, so I yeah I appreciate that. Um, he's very. He's very tuned into that, so I'm I'm grateful that he's. We have a good relationship, and um, he wants to be as helpful as he can. Mm -hmm. um, along with the, let's see, we were just talking about financing, and and uh, and you asked, let's see, how'd that go? You you said you saw a bunch of people talking to their neighbors. Anyways, what what I was thinking about is um, in Greg Judy's book. Uh, in Joel Salton's book, You Can Farm, I've read some about it and some of the things Alan Nation's written. They all suggest that a farm will pay either a living or a mortgage, but not both. Is it um, unrealistic to think that we could set up some sort of a farming enterprise where we could earn a living, where we could create the money and then save the capital to purchase the land as an after-tax investment? Um, to separate the land ownership from the land use, from the land from business, uh, and then, I, sorry for you guys, I mean, kind of cut, cut the lender out. I mean, that's a pile of money that's going out of this business, out of this enterprise. Is that an unrealistic expectation? That, that, is, that is a tough question, and I would say for the most part, it probably is in the sense that if you've got investors like uh, Dave's involved with, they're going to want to get a return on their investment. If they invest whatever price uh, per acre for that land, they're going to want to see a return on their investment. The farmer that's farming that land, uh, you know, unless they've got some really strong non-farm income to support it and they're willing to uh, operate at zero, they're probably going to ultimately want to see a return on their, uh, on their sweat equity and on their, on their work. would be in the form of a cash rent or a lease um, so that he's carrying the burden of that land. Alan Nation writes a lot about that land used to be able to be purchased for its carrying capacity for approximately 10 years of what it would produce is, was about what the f land was worth. Um, that's no longer the case. It, it, land is, is more than just production value, you know. Now there's so much more bit into it. There's recreational use whether it be hunting ground or just uh, outside investors that are looking for a tax-sheltered environment or something that might be um, inflation-protected. Uh, 
all of that is bid into the price of this land. So in my experience or the, the numbers that we've ran, it's much pro more profitable to rent ground than it is to own it. There's a lot more tied into the cost of ownership than just the productivity of the land. I, mean, I can tell you with regard to how we price a lease um, where there is an investor ownership, um, currently we set about a 3% return. So the, uh, the ownership for a, for, for a base rent would be getting a 3% return. That doesn't mean they're getting cash. It just means the company is getting a 3% uh, it, back, back into the company. So. Thanks for the questions, everybody. This is dismissed. We'll go to our networking break for the next half hour. And thank you so much for being here with us on Saturday. Met on the Carolinian heading south from D.C. Says he's got himself had picked out of seats. She smiled in said Richmond when asked where she was bound. Began to wish my life away.